Welcome back, Dr. Lloyd. You can hear me. I can. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good. And you can see me. I hope. I can. Good. Uh, well, that's a, a good start. I hope we continue. If, if we have further patchy reception, we'll just have to try and live, live with it. Um, but uh, we're ready to start again. Uh, and you are in the same position. And it's just after just uh, after or on uh, 8 o'clock in the morning for you. 8 o'clock. So thank you once yes. again for joining us uh, then. Ms. Richards. Do Dr. Lloyd, can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Now, yesterday, we had looked at your notes from that April 1985 symposium on AIDS, where you outlined some of the measures that might need to be considered by the transfusion service. Before we look at um, those measures, just one other matter relating to a response to AIDS that I wanted to ask you about. In 1983, 84, 85, you obviously weren't based at the centre. Um, do, do you know, either from discussions with Dr Collins or discussions with Dr Peter Jones or, or, or through any other route, whether Dr Collins was ever asked to increase the production of cryoprecipitate at that time? Right. Um, production of cryoprecipitate was very much on a... It's a daily decision. Um, although it's a frozen product, you can store it. So um, you look at how much you have in your, in your store and you decide whether or not to produce more. You don't necessarily produce it every day, um, you would hopefully you would tend to do a run, particularly in the old centre where the production was in a different building. Um, but there was no there's no problem in producing more cryoprecipitate. It's not a difficult thing to do. Uh, once you're set up to produce it, you can you know you can turn the tap on. You can say today instead of making um, just plain. FFP for clinical use, fresh frozen plasma for clinical use, will make cryoprecipitate. And so you can do a run of another 100 that day if you, if you so wish. So as far as I'm aware, we never, we just produced the center, in, in Anne Collins' day, the center just produced enough cryoprecipitate to, we, to be sure that there was product on the shelf for when it was requested. Um, so if we were asked for more, then yes, we would produce more. Um, it, it wasn't a big issue. Um, but as far as you know, and it may be you simply don't know, um, do, was a request, a, a, any particular request for more as a response to the threat of AIDS in, in that early period? Do you know whether that was ever made to Dr. Collins? I don't recall her ever saying that she had received us a specific request. Um, we've seen some of my data that shows that the amount of cryoprecipitate going to the RBI and therefore the haemophilia center um, was actually going down a little bit. Um, but they could, have they could have requested more. We obviously had the product. Thank you. Now, I want to move then to the, um, the, the donor leaflets. Um, in, introduced in 1983, and I, again, I'm very conscious that you were not um, um, in post uh, at, at the centre at that point in time. Um, but I'm going to ask you to look at a couple of documents in any event. Uh, if we start with NHBT Um, so, Dr. Lloyd, th this was a letter sent by Dr. Wagstar from Sheffield, 6th of July yes. 1983, to his regional transfusion director colleagues, enclosing over the page what was intended to be the, the final version of the, um, of the AIDS leaflet for national use. Yes. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through the detail mm -hmm. of the leaflet. Now, that was early July 1983. The inquiry knows from other evidence that the Department of Health became involved and the final leaflet was only issued at the beginning of September, and we'll just look briefly at that, 
for the benefit, really, of those watching, BPLL 0007247. And, and there we have the national leaflet from September 1983. Do you know, either from your later involvement or, again, from conversations with Dr Collins, whether... In Newcastle, um, any earlier leaflet of Newcastle's own devising was introduced, or whether Newcastle waited for the national leaflet? Sorry, I've, uh, I've lost you. Or whether Newcastle was... Uh, whether Newcastle introduced, as some centres did their own earlier leaflet, or whether Newcastle waited for this national leaflet to become available in September? I'm certainly not aware that we issued anything earlier. Um, I can't say we didn't, but I personally am not aware of it. Um, and then um, I'm again going to ask you to look at a document you wouldn't have seen at the time, but it gives us some information about the method of distribution of the leaflet deployed at Newcastle, mm -hmm. CBLA 0001820, please. Um, th this was a table uh, com compiled for the Advisory Committee on the National Blood Transfusion Service, AIDS leaflet first six months experience. Yes. And we just need to look at the entry for Newcastle at the top of the page. Distribution method with call-up cards displayed on industrial sessions issued to Citizens Advice Bureau, STD clinics, number used 110,000, stock 3,000. And then we have donor response effect on attendance nil, two or three resigned because of homosexual relationships. And then other comments, one donor... I think that should be thought, he could contract AIDS from donation. Who is at risk? Final, might, that might be paragraph or part, may be read paragraph. as if, if you mm -hmm. get jaundice, yes. you may get AIDS. Majority don't know what hepatitis B is. Um, so we, we can see there, I think, um, and pl please let me know if this is your understanding, Dr Lloyd, three methods of distribution there described. Um, in terms of the general public, it would appear that the leaflet was being sent out with the call-up cards so donors could take a decision in advance about not attending. Mm -hmm. And then in relation to yes. the industrial sessions, where presumably the centre wouldn't know the, who, uh, who individually would be attending, it was on display. And then Newcastle then took a further step, which is to provide the leaflet to local Citizens Advice Bureau and STD clinics. Was that still mm -hmm. the, the system of distribution with later versions of the leaflet when, when you came back to the centre full time? We, yeah, we sent out um, AIDS leaflets when they were changed, so they went out with the call-up cards. Um, they were more like little cards than letters in the, in the earlier days. Um, but yes, we sent out the new new versions as they became available, so we would do a new distribution. Um, but we still had the issue that at industrial sessions, you we didn't individually call up. The call up was done within the, the factory or office uh, complex. And so then it was a matter of just displaying it at the clinic, which is not as good a situation as providing it in advance, I have to say. Um, so, yes, we, we continue to do this. this. Um, now, we've, the inquiries heard evidence from the North London Regional Transfusion um, Centre about an additional measure which they introduced, um, which was the completion of a, of a confidential exclusion questionnaire, which enabled the donor um, to, as it were, save face potentially, by ticking a box which uh, meant that their donation might be used, for example, for research rather than uh, for um, transfusion. Well, do you know whether a system like that was ever in operation in, in the northern region? Yeah, the, the confidential exclusion um, certainly rings a bell with me, and I'm not, I'm not sure now whether I'm just remembering what North London did or whether 
it was what we did. Um, it, it is familiar, but I again, I, I couldn't tell you definitively that that's what we had on the session. I'm sorry. Um, if we then move forward to the point in time or a point in time at which you're, you're at the centre, uh, if we go to NHBT 018280, please. Um, so this is a memo from you, Dr. Lloyd, dated the 22nd of January 1987 um, to the Sessional Medical Officers and the Regional Transfusion mm -hmm. Centre Medical Officers. The subject is AIDS, risk groups yeah. in Africa and, and donor rejections. Um, and then we can see the, the background from paragraph A um, because the leaflet now identified uh, um, certain risk groups in relation to uh, Africa. I just wanted to ask you about B. Mm -hmm the arrangements at the sessions. So it says here, the arrangements at sessions should be as follows. The session clerk will ask donors whether they've been in Africa and if so, where in Africa and when. If the donor's been in the relevant area since 1978, then further questioning will be required. The clerk will then take the donor to see the session MO. The session MO will discuss the matter further in confidence. It may be difficult to ask donors about their sexual activities in the rather public circumstances of a blood donor session. The MO must, however, ensure that the donor has read and understood the AIDS leaflet, and we can see the version there was September 86, or the AIDS poster. Mm -hmm. It may be necessary to explain mm -hmm. the risk group in more detail, but every care must be taken not to offend donors. If the donor is suitable to donate, he or she should be shown back to the clerk. Donors who are not suitable to donate should be offered further advice through an MO at the RTC. And then if we just read paragraph C... Donors who are in any AIDS risk group must not be bled. Where there is any doubt about the risk, they should not be bled. But in either case, the potential donor should be sympathetically dealt with and arrangements made for an MO from the centre to contact them, especially where doubt exists. Some donors may not wish any further contact, and this should be respected. And note-giving details must be sent to an MO at the centre in a sealed envelope. Um, now, obviously, this memo has been prompted by the specific issue of questions about visits to, to Africa. But if we just go back and look at paragraph yeah. B, please, um, Sully. Thank you. Um, the, um, you're here emphasizing that the medical office must, must ensure that the donors read and understood the AIDS leaflet or the AIDS poster. Was that um, mm -hmm. something um, a new requirement that you were introducing at this point in time, or were you emphasising that which the MO should have been doing in any event? Goodness. Um, trying to re recall. Um, reading, you know, what I wrote, it doesn't look to me like I'm introducing something new. I'm just reinforcing an existing situation because of the particularly emphasizing the change in risk areas. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if they'd all been included in the new AIDS leaflet at that particular moment. I think there was some, some delay between recognizing larger risk areas and actually getting that information into, into leaflets. Um, so as far as I can see from the way I've written this, um, I'm just emphasizing you know, what we're already doing um, we can take that down. Thank you, Sully. Um, can I then move and, and deal very briefly with the question of the introduction of screening or testing for uh, HTLV3 or HIV, um, which was in October... I'm um, sorry, I lost, I lost you then. C can you hear me I again now? I lost you again. Could you say... Yes, if uh, you start that question again. Of course. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask you very briefly about the introduction of uh, HIV screening at the centre. Um, my mm -hmm. understanding um, from the documents and from your statement is that you had no involvement either in the decision-making regarding HTLV3 screening or in its introduction at the centre. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. 
Um, so I'm just going to show, for the sake of completeness, one document. It's not a doc document Dr Lloyd's seen, and I'm not actually asking Dr Lloyd anything about it. It's just for the benefit of those watching and listening. Um, DHSC 0101735. Oh, you don't have it. In that case, I'll come back to it later. So, um, uh, it, it, for the benefit of the transcript, um, it's a letter from Dr. Collins do, to Dr. Smithers uh, in late 1985, and it sets out what arrangements have been made in terms of ensuring um, that hospitals um, did not use untested stocks. So, uh, um, the reference is on the transcript for the benefit of anyone who uh, wants to consider that letter, um, and if I get a chance to display it later, I will. Um, before I leave the issue of AIDS, um, Dr Lloyd, and, and come on to ask you about hepatitis C screening, I just wanted to ask you about investigation of cases of transfusion transmitted or possible transfusion transmitted HIV. And I'll do that by reference to a, a document you've seen and talked about in your statement. It's at DHSC 00... 20840 underscore 041. Um, so you can see, Dr. Lloyd, this is a letter from you to Dr. Raymond at the Department of Health, October yes. 1992. <laughs> Um, and it concerned the Department of Health scheme of payments for those infected with HIV through blood or tissue transfer. Um, you refer to a file relating to the transfusion of a particular individual, and obviously we're not going to mention that individual by name. Yes. Um, uh, uh, and if I just read the first paragraph, no new information has come to light since the original investigation. I enclose for your information a copy of the report I wrote in 1986 which identifies the donations originally transfused to her and the related investigations. One of the two units transfused to her came from a donor who subsequently donated and was found to be HIV negative. The other donation came from a donor who left our area and to the best of our knowledge transferred into the West Midlands. At the time, the transfusion center based at Birmingham had no record of this donor donating. And I've again checked with the donor service department at the Birmingham transfusion center and they still have no record of this individual donating. This, therefore, leaves the possibility that this donation came from a donor who was HIV positive. On the other hand, there is no evidence to suggest that the individual is infectious. Um, uh, and then you refer to information relating to the individual's husband, um, uh, who had been a donor, and the donation had been tested and was uh, HIV negative. And if we go over the page... <laughs> We can see this was your report from, um, I think, 1986, uh, where you set out the donation history of the individual. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as I understand it, um, uh, the investigations that there were then made in relation to those two donors. And if we look at the bottom of the page, we can see in relation to the second donor who had donated at a time when no yes. HIV testing was available. You record that the donors left the factory at which the donations were made and has not replied to call-up requests made in 1984 and 1985. One further mm -hmm. request to attend a donor session um, is being made. Um, and then uh, you um, go on to set out over the following pages. I don't think we need to go through them. Um, Follow-up of various other donations. Yes. Do, do you recall whether this was the only such investigation which you carried out, or, or were there others? I don't recall any others. Um, you know, the, the northern region didn't, you know, had a, a very low incidence of HIV positivity amongst blood donors. I, I think we're talking perhaps about one in a year. So, on that basis, the chances of a donation which was infectious for HIV but was negative by test 
is presumably less than one per year. Um, so it, it's not a common thing, <coughs> pardon me, it's not a common thing uh, in the region. <coughs> and therefore, I can understand that we, you know, you're not going to have had many investigations because there were very few infectious units at that time. So it doesn't surprise me that that's the only one I recall. Um, I, I would be right to understand that this case may illustrate the limitations of the investigations which you were able to undertake because in relation to the second mm -hmm. dona donor uh, whose donation may have been the infectious donation, you had no samples post the availability of testing uh, and uh, you, you were unable to track that donor once they'd, they'd left the area. Yes, we wouldn't have kept, we didn't keep samples um, <clears throat> for later testing. And I think the donations, if I recall from what I just saw, was, were from 1982. Um, <clears throat> yes. So, um, no, we certainly didn't keep samples. Um, we weren't testing for HIV in, in 1982. And as you said, we had, uh, there were definite limitations on how we um, further explored the possibility of that individual being HIV positive. Um, looking back on it, I'm not really sure that they were. It, was, it would have been a very, pretty unusual for 1982 in, in the region. Not unknown, certainly not. Um, but we didn't, uh, as you saw, we only followed up to the one transfusion center um, in the West Midlands that we thought the person might have transferred to. Um, we could and perhaps should have um, circulated all the transfusion centers, um, both in, the U in England and Wales and in Scotland. Um, I don't think there was a sort of, there certainly wasn't a system for doing it. But when you look back, you say, well, yes, maybe we should, we sh A, we should have done more, uh, and B, um, you know, maybe there should have been a, a, a more formal system that would have made it easier uh, to do this. Um, and, and then if, if I just ask you to look at a, a, re a reply from Dr. Raymond to you, DHSC 00208403031. underscore zero three one. Um, so um, this is a response to you, 4th of November 1992, mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Raymond sets out in the second paragraph, it would appear the donor who failed to reattend may be the cause of the HIV infection. And then he goes on to set out a protocol agreed with CDSC. Um, uh, um, and in the last paragraph, he explains we've agreed the following procedure yes. in an effort to mm -hmm. minimize the risk of any breach of confidentiality concerning the donor. Um, uh, and then we can see it, it, it essentially involves contact being made with CDSC and then CDSC would notify the department but wouldn't notify the regional transfusion centre. We see that over the top of the page. Yes, yes. But, do, you, um, do you know whether uh, um, anything further was done in that regard? As far as I know, um, this donor um, did not come up on the on the panel on the CDSC. Um, I think Dr. Raymond would have uh, would have let us would have let me know. So I, I had no further follow up from this. Um, I'm not quite sure how the department planned <clears throat> to deal with the information. Should it, have, you know? come to their attention. If CDSC found that this person had been reported to them or um, they had information that this person was HIV positive, they were obviously prepared to send this information in confidence to the department um, who presumably would have some method of dealing with it. And given that there was a, you know, a definite drive to, to understand, to find people find out how people have been infected through transfusion, um, 
that information would have had to have come back um, in some way. And I, I never had any, I don't recall any further follow-up on, on this. Sir, I, I should say we do have the Department of Health files in relation to this application, and it may be something we pick up in future uh, hearings relating to transfusion practice. There is nothing to suggest any further information go, coming Dr. Lloyd's way from those files. Um, I'm, I'm going to move then to um, the question of um, uh, surrogate testing. Um, first of all, so surrogate testing for non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, you told us yesterday you thought that probably ALT testing should have been introduced. Um, I'm just going to ask you to look with me at a passage in your statement and then I'll just ask you a couple of further questions in relation to that. Mm -hmm. So WITN 6935001, please, Sully, Dr. Lloyd's witness statement. And if we go to page 83... Uh, so picking it up at the bottom of the page, there's a heading surrogate testing for non-A, non-B. Um, and you say this in your final paragraph on that page, I did consider that surrogate testing might have reduced risk, but the use of surrogate testing is difficult in that there was no clear link between test results and infectivity. I was not opposed to additional testing, but it was not being put forward for use in the UK, and I acquiesced in this decision given the weight of expertise in the transfusion mm -hmm. service on the topic. And then top of the next page, you say, to decide to not introduce surrogate testing given the information on the reduction in non-A, non-B hepatitis in recipients was, from my limited perspective, a decision not to apply a maximum safety ethos. I think that a substantive trial in the UK would have provided a better basis on which to make a decision data from other countries did not necessarily apply in the UK. From what I've seen, US data was also not current in terms of donor screening and also due to the different blood collection arrangements in the US. This was not a simple decision to make. Now, just we, we, we have, therefore, that. We have your evidence yesterday, Dr. Lloyd, that um, you think probably ALT testing should have been introduced. Um, the, the other form of surrogate, the other surrogate marker potentially in relation to non-A, non-B hepatitis would be anti-HBC testing. I'll come back to the later question of, of, of anti-HBC testing in relation to hepatitis B in, in the 1990s. Yeah. Um, but in relation to anti-HBC testing, either on its own or, or combined with ALT testing as a, as a surrogate marker for non-A, non-B hepatitis, do, do you have any views on, on whether that could or should have been introduced at some point in the 80s? That, yeah, it's a difficult, the, 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 we know from studies that there was an overlap between those two tests, that they weren't defining the same uh, range, the same infect, infectious nature of the donations, I not put that very well. Um, so you've got two tests, that, that neither of which specifically identifies what became hepatitis C, um, but both do pick up some of it and they pick up different sort of spectrums of it from what i read alt was probably um more effective in doing that oh dear we've just lost i'm sorry something has happened at this end um we can still see and hear you dr lloyd can you see and you hear? can yes. I, but i've lost my I've lost my screen completely. Ah. Um, if you ah, we're, we're back, I'm sorry. Yes. I think an auto switch off occurred. Don't worry. Um, so yes, we have this sort of, uh, what I thought was that the ALT test was probably um, the more effective. Um, yes, you get a better coverage if you put the two together. Um, but, you know, at the time, there seemed to be a fairly strong view that we shouldn't introduce it. Um, I, I should have stood up and said we should. Well, well, we'll move next to the topic where you did stand up and say that you should, and that's the question of hepatitis C screening, Dr. Lloyd. Um, now, there's 
quite a number of documents I want to look at with you on this issue. Um, I, I we'll go through them um, in a largely chronological order. I'm going to ask you some questions about the various documents um, and your statement, and, and then some general questions um, wo woven in about this issue of, of screening for hepatitis C. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with WITN 69350032. Um, so this is headed the current corporation test for non-A, non-B hepatitis. Lecture by Dr. Michael Houghton of the Chiron Corporation, Sheffield Medical School, mm -hmm. Thursday, 6th of July, 1989. Um, and the, the, we don't need to go to the last page, but it, your name is at the bottom of this document um, with that date of the 6th of July. So do we understand this is a lecture you attended and took notes of, and this is your typed up copy of your notes? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, it's my writing in the top right-hand corner showing that I wanted to file it. Um, and uh, yes, these are the notes that I made. Um, and, and if we go over the page, we can see that um, there's a heading correlation with the surrogate markers for non-A, non-B hepatitis. I'm not proposing to go to that, but just note that that's there. Um, uh, and then if we go to the third page, bottom of the page, There's a section on costs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, you refer to the cost per sample for the kit. You say it looks likely this test will soon be required in the UK. The cost of tester will be of the order of 200,000 to 230,000 per annum. We will lose about 600 donors mm -hmm. from our present panel. We'll have to destroy at least 600 donations in the first year. The cost of this will be around four to 5,000 pounds to replace the lost donors and 15 to 20,000 pounds for the destroyed donations, together with the additional clerical costs and medical costs of dealing with 600 extremely anxious donors. An additional medical session may be required during the first year or two to deal with these donors. These donors will need to be referred to specialists in liver disease, which in turn will have considerable cost implications. The total cost of the BTS in the first year will be between 219,000 and 255,000 on a very crude costing. Um, now, just pausing there, that presumably is not part of the lecture. These are your own thoughts about what it's going to cost. Yes. Yeah. And, and these are costs yes, in, to the in northern Newcastle. region. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. This, is, this was me looking at the, what I'd seen in the, in, and heard at the meeting um, and trying to translate it into what it was going to mean um, for our centre. Um, and were there other regional transfusion directors at this, at this lecture or meeting, that, as far as you can recall? You may have no memory at all of it. I can't. I can't. I, I can't recall. No, I'm sorry. Um, and if we go over the page, we've got the summary. Um, a non-A, non-B hepatitis has been characterised and termed hepatitis C virus. And then I don't propose to read out the rest of that paragraph. Um, if we go to the mm -hmm. third paragraph, you say this, the impact on our donor base will be moderate but not catastrophic, mm -hmm. assuming that the 0.5% positivity level is confirmed. We will lose and have to replace 600 donors. There will be costs and operational problems associated with identifying them as HCV positive, and they will have to be referred to consultants specialising in liver work. Mm -hmm. And then the last sentence has your um, cost, your, your estimated cost to the northern region of the mm -hmm. BTS mm -hmm. for, for the first year. So... It looks from this as though, as at July 1989, you were effectively planning ahead, both in terms of what kind of funding might need um, to be put in place and what might need to be done to ensure um, that there wasn't a significant loss of donors without them, them being replaced. Is, is, that, is that fair? Yes, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I think the fact that I could... You know, it was going to be difficult, but it was certainly no way impossible. Um, 600 donor loss, and I think I mentioned it yesterday, that's not a lot of donors lost um, <clears throat> compared to some of the problems we had when a lot of our industry closed down. Um, and then if we look at NHBT 00000188 underscore 008,
This is a letter from you, 20th of July, 1989, so a couple of weeks um, after you've yes. attended uh, that um, uh, meeting, um, to the Director of Management Services at the Northern Regional Health Authority, um, a headed non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, you say this in the first paragraph, the problem of non-A, non-B hepatitis has been with us for many years. This disease is transmissible by blood, but no test has been available to screen out infected blood donors. Most people who have non-A, non-B hepatitis and continue to carry the virus are asymptomatic, although a very small proportion of people go on to get cirrhosis of the liver. The effects of transfusion transmitted non-A, non-B hepatitis vary from nil through a minor illness with no jaundice to a moderately severe illness with jaundice with a small proportion of people going on to become long-term carriers of the virus. It is these people who get long-term carriage of the virus who run the risk of getting cirrhosis of the liver and possibly even hepatic carcinoma. Um, and then you go on, having introduced non-A, non-B hepatitis to Mr. Garland, to um, refer to the test. We look at the fourth paragraph, you say, now that this test is available, I suspect the pressure will mount fairly rapidly for this test to be introduced in this country. Previously, I had expected that something as major as this, which would have to be introduced in all transfusion services in the UK, would be funded by the department. However, Dr. Gunson has suggested to me that this will not be the case and that regions will be expected to fund this new development themselves. Now, that would um, indicate that you had had some discussion with Dr. Gunson on the issue of introducing the tests and, and how they might be funded. Do you, do you have any further recollection of the discussions at, at, at that point in time? Um, the, there is a letter that I think from a, perhaps a month later <clears throat> in which Dr. Gunson refers to the department um, in f not funding um, or, or that regions would have to fund themselves. So there is some documentation that comes after this letter. So I, I don't recall the exact <clears throat> discussions I had with Dr. Gunson, um, or whether that was at a meeting or whether it was by phone. Given the short interval between the um, meeting I attended in Sheffield and, and writing this, um, it was probably something, <clears throat> there was a phone call, but no, I can't recall the, the details of it. And then if, if we go over the page, We can see you set out in the first paragraph costs and some of the implications in terms of um, loss of donors and loss of donations and what would need to be done. Um, and then the next paragraph, you give a, um, a, not a detailed estimate, but an estimate of the total figure in the first year and then it would fall after the first year. Um, and then you say, at the moment, there's nothing mm -hmm. to be done about this, but I felt it was worth highlighting this situation as we do not know at what stage we might be instructed to introduce this new test. At the present time, the virus detected by this test has been designated as hepatitis C virus. So, um, mm -hmm. what, what, what was it that prompted you to make this relatively early contact with your regional health authority? And, and what then happened in terms of your dialogue with the health authority? Well, um, the the fact that we, this was quite a big, you know, step um, to undertake. I mean, in the overall terms of the NHS, you know, £250,000 seems nothing, but um, within our budget, it was, it was significant. Um, so I, I needed the RHA to be aware that, you know, people don't like being surprised. <laughs> You don't want someone to phone you up and say, oh, we're starting the test tomorrow, by the way, we need £250,000. Um, so, you know, you want to start the dialogue as early as possible. Um, then they can ask, they have time to ask questions and B, they have time to um, adjust their funding model um, for the next year. Uh, so, you know, we, we were, you asked me about my relationship with the RHA before. Um, it, it was a reasonable relationship, and um, you know there was backwards and forwards, and I didn't want to um, cause them a problem, um, and this was just part of the process of getting this whole thing rolling, um, and uh, so that they weren't uh, weren't blindsided by it. 
and, and we don't, I think, have the details of your further discussions with the, with the health authority in, in documentary form, but you tell us in your statement you kept the regional health authority informed as time went on, and the result, as I understand mm -hmm. it, was that when, when we get to 1991, and we'll, we'll look at what happened in between in, in a moment, but when you, when you got to mm -hmm. 1991, you had the agreement of the regional health authority for um, funds to be used to introduce testing. Is that, in broad terms, that's, that's yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, now, if we just then, however, go back to 1989, I just want to pick matters up in November 1989 um, with NHBT 0005043. <coughs> Now, these are the minutes of a meeting of the Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood, 6th of November 1989. Um, you, you weren't, of course, on this committee, and I think we, we see, obviously, that it, it was chaired by Dr. Metters, who was Deputy Chief Medical Officer, um, um, and um, it, in terms of representing the Blood Transfusion Service, it, it, it had Dr. Gunson amongst its members. Um, we know from other material, Dr. Lloyd, that the minutes of the um, Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood were intended to be confidential. And uh, as I understand yes. it, you and your colleagues in the Regional Transfusion Service did not at the time see these documents. Is that, is that correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I think I said in my witness statement, if, if I had seen some of this or known about some of this, I might have taken a, a somewhat stronger line. Um, I, I didn't know that uh, what was being discussed, particularly this uh, relatively early, November 1989. Um, and, of course and it wasn't transmitted by Dr. Sorry, I was going to say, it, it, as far as I recall, Dr. Gunson wasn't relaying the detail. And I think in, in a conversation with um, John Cash, I think, you know, he intimates that he can't actually pass some of this information on. Um, it's not for publication and therefore presumably not for other distribution. Um, and just, um, uh, even though you wouldn't have seen it at the time, just to complete looking at this document, the discussion of the testing starts on page four. Yes, NHBT 00005043. And if you go now to page four. Um, I, I won't read it all out, but we see paragraph 23 is Dr. Gunson um, talking about a paper um, that uh, had been prepared and referring to a meeting that had taken place in Rome. Um, there's then... Yes. Uh, uh, paragraph 25, Do Dr. Tedder giving the committee a summary of the history of the test. 26, Dr. Metters explained that although the department must bear in mind the possible litigation that could arise from a prolonged delay in the introduction of general screening, the NHS management executive would want to know more facts and figures before backing such a move. Dr. Gunson then provides some information um, based upon the North London Transfusion Centre's experience. And then if we go to the next page, paragraph 28, the feeling of the committee as summed up by the chairman was that the test represented a major step forward, but that the committee needed to know a great, need to know a great deal more about it and acknowledge the need for a confirmatory test. Uh, it was agreed that while the UK would not want to go on in advance of an FDA decision, it would prove difficult if the FDA do not decide in, in favour um, of the test. Um, so that's the position as at November of, of, of 1989. Um, now, yes. um, I, I don't know whether from your subsequent involvement in, in this issue, you have any particular observations or comments upon the stance being taken by the ACVSB as at November 1989. It's the sort of a little bit of the beginning of um, almost a dance around the, the issue of the test. There's no 
confirmatory test we hear here you know, we see in this uh, being put forward uh, well the FDA you know are they are they not going to approve it, it it's it at this stage this particular document seems um, a little bit unclear although they're saying yes we should test then they're saying well maybe there's issues um, and maybe we don't want to do it just yet or at all and um, now that that's November 1989 and um We'll, we'll be exploring, Dr. Lloyd, with, with other witnesses or, or through other witnesses, um, I hope, some of the, the events, particularly from a department perspective, um, uh, through into 1990. I want to pick things up in the middle of 1990, um, July of 1990. I don't, I'm afraid, have the document to display, but I'll, I'll read the reference um, for the benefit of those listening, PRSE 40976 is a further meeting of the Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood in which they recommend that the, there should be a, a evaluation of the two commercial kits that were then available, Ortho and Abbott, to be done in three centres, Glasgow, North London and Newcastle. Um, and so if we then pick things up with a letter copied to you in August of 1990, NHBT... 0000061 underscore 180. We can see 30th of August 1990. If we just look at the whole letter, please. It's from Dr. Gunson to Dr. Raymond, and we can see at the bottom it says same letter to, uh, um, and then it's listed Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Lloyd, yes. um, yourself, Dr. Barbara, and, and others. Um, yeah. um, and then we can see it's, um, Dr. Gunson says he hopes this is the final draft of the proposals for the proposed study comparing anti-HCV testing using ortho and Abbott test systems. Um, now, th there have been some other studies and evaluations going on in the intervening period in which I think Newcastle was not involved. But can you recall how you came to be involved in, in this proposed um, comparison of the two tests? I'm not quite sure why we were. It may well have been that they wanted um, a couple of centers that, or they wanted a center that was um, comfortable using the Abbott test and the Abbott test equipment. Um, we were certainly in a position to, to do it. Um, and I think uh, Ruth and Mitchell, I, I think the Glasgow center, I'm not sure if they were doing, using it as well, but, um, Certainly, we were using the Abbott system, um, quite happy to participate, but I don't recall why we were approached specifically. Okay. Um, if we look at um, NHBT 00000042 underscore 045, So this is now um, a couple of months later, and Dr. Gunson is mm -hmm. um, sending a report on, on phase one of, of this trial, um, which I think is how this particular evaluation was, was, uh, um, was characterized, to Dr. Raymond. Um, we've got the report itself at NHBT 40190 underscore 030. If we just look briefly at that. Yes, NHBT 0000190 underscore 030. So comparison of anti-HCV tests using Abbott and Ortho test kits, a multi-centered trial, summary of results of phase one of the trial, um, and it's, this is authored by Dr. Gunson, 29th of October. I, I'm not going to go through the detail of it. If we look over the page, however, we can see 
it, this is the study comparing the, the results of using the two different kits, the Abbott and the Ortho kits, involving Glasgow, yourself, and North London. Um, and we can see yes. if we go to page three. Para 1.7, all three RTCs reported that the tests were easy to perform uh, and that the manufacturer's instructions were, were user-friendly. Um, uh, um, there were some then specific comments made by the, yourself and the various other, and the other two centres, but I, I'm not going to take up time looking at those specific comments. But what, what did you understand the, the purpose of, of this comparative evaluation to be? What, and for whose benefit it was being carried out? This seems seemed to me to be um, a way of, insu of ensuring um, that both tests were um, suitable for use. Um, it didn't... We know that different centres in the UK use different test methods, different, you know, kits from different companies, and we're used to using things in different ways. So you need to know that, A, that both tests are usable, that they're not completely terrible to use. Um, I think we saw in some later tests that one of the test kits presented for comparison, um, actually, it might have been for HIV, you know, one of the test kits was actually quite difficult to use and difficult to get consistent results. So here we have a trial. It shows that both test kits um, are usable within the transfusion center setting, um, and they give comparable results, as one would expect. They're not perfectly the same, um, but substantially the same. Uh, so it gave me um, quite a lot of confidence that we, you know, we had something we could do. We could use this. Um, now, we, we know... Sorry. Um, so you froze for a moment then, Dr. Lloyd, which is why I paused. Um, yeah. Um, we, we know um, that by this time, this is August of 1990, when the study is uh, protocol, as it were, is being drawn up, and then October 1990, when um, it's, it's been concluded, um, we know that there were a number of other countries which had already introduced hepatitis C screening, mm -hmm. um, but by this point in time, I think Japan in November 1989, and then a number of other countries throughout 1990. Mm -hmm. do, do you recall whether you were aware of that at the time, or, or whether there was any discussion amongst regional transfusion directors about the fact that the UK was, a, was arguably lagging behind other developed nations? I don't recall specific um, discussions. Um, you know, one of the problems we've seen uh, and discussed with the national directorate splitting up the transfusion center directors into uh, these divisional groups, we didn't have a single forum where everyone could get together. So, um, whereas quite a lot of work on uh, virological matters was, was done uh, from the North London Centre, um, there wasn't that emphasis from the centres that happened to be in the Northern Division. So we were divorced from a lot of this discussion. Um, so, and of course, we didn't have anyone from the department who might have brought a perspective to bear. So, no, we didn't have a lot of discussion, uh, certainly aware that this test is being used. I mean, you know, I knew that at the time. Um, there's no doubt about that. The, here's a test. It's being used. Um, we've done the first, we've done a test, uh, shown it works. So, you know, next step is to use it. <laughs> it, it it's just sort of a logical progression. And, and if we then look at another meeting of the advisory committee on the virological safety of blood from November 1990, NHBT 00000073 underscore 018. 
Um, so we can see the date of the meeting, 21st of November 1990. If we go over the page... We've got the heading hepatitis C testing. Um, the chairman recalled the summing up of the last meeting, said that a note had gone to ministers telling them that the ACVSB was in favour of introducing routine HCV testing in the UK. A further submission was awaiting the decision of this meeting as to which test would be the most suitable. The chairman reiterated the recommendation that all plasma should be tested for HCV. There's then a discussion of various papers and studies, which I'm not going to go through. If we go to the top of the next page, paragraph 10 says, the committee agreed that it was important to start screening as soon as practicable mm -hmm. as a measure which would further enhance the safety of the blood supply. Now, I think one of the observations you've made in your witness statement, Dr. Lloyd, as I understand it, is that had you, had you known this, that this was the view of the committee at this point in time, it might have made you want to start testing earlier than you did, recognising that you were still earlier Absolutely. than everyone else. Um, but this message was Absolutely. never conveyed to you, is that right? I never saw this, never heard this. Um, and looking back now, I'm rather, I, I'm, I'm somewhat annoyed that this sort of information wasn't provided, um, left in the dark, and uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and then if we go over the page, just two further paragraphs I want to read with you, and then I want to look at some of the observations you make on it in your statement. So paragraph 18, the chairman summed up the discussion by saying that there was agreement that the UK should introduce hepatitis C testing as soon as practicable. RTCs would decide individually whether to use ortho or Abbott test. The blood from any repeat positives would be set aside. And then there's a discussion of the arrangements. Um, uh, uh, and then there's a reference in the penultimate sentence there to the reference centres determining a protocol for supplementary costing. A submission would go to ministers regarding this significant policy decision and the management executive would consider the funding aspect. And then if we go to the paragraph 21 further down the page, last sentence, the chairman stressed the importance of a common date of introduction throughout... Um, the UK. Um, in, in fact, I should, mm -hmm. I think, I, sh I should read the, um, the sentences above that. He reported, this is Dr. Gunson, that some centres had asked for a six-month period in which to set up testing. Dr. Gunson himself thought this to be excessive, but he said he would need to consult with other directors first. It was agreed that he would hold off consultation until the submission had been put to ministers. And then we have the sentence, the chairman stressed the importance of a common date of introduction yeah. throughout the UK. Um, and what I wanted to do, Dr. Lloyd, I think is because you, you deal with this in your statement, is just look at a, a page from your statement where you comment upon these minutes. WITN 6935001, please, Sally, page 86. So you say this, in the minutes of the November 1990 meeting of the ACVSB, the statement, the, ja the chairman stressed the importance of a common date of introduction throughout the UK, mm -hmm. which is what we were just looking at, is presented without any background information. There's nothing in the document that indicates why the chairman came to this conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, then you say this, I note these statements in the document, and then paragraph 10 uh, from the minutes, the committee agreed it was important to start screening as soon as practicable. Paragraph 18, the chairman summed up the discussion by saying that there was agreement the UK should introduce hepatitis C testing as soon as practicable. And then paragraph 21, some centres had asked for a six-month period in which to set up testing. And your observation there is this suggests some disconnect in the thinking as soon as practicable, but only if all together. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any, anything further you would, would wish to add on, on, on that issue um, from, on, and on the basis of what we see in those minutes, Dr Lloyd? No, I think that, that pretty much sums it up. It's, you get this feeling through these minutes that, yes, we, we're going to do it, but uh, there always seems to be a little if, a but um, behind it. Um, uh, instead of just getting on with it, I mean, we've, 
we've decided, they've already decided this is a test that needs to be done. <laughs> and yet we're flip-flopping about. Um, as to the altogether, um, I've seen that in documents that Dr. Gunson produced before. So my feeling, and that's purely a personal thing, um, don't, I can't say substantively, but it seems that it was Dr. Gunson who had this view that altogether was the necessary, uh, was the imperative. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I'd seen it in other documents he, he prepared. Um, so I, I feel that's where that came from. Um, and as, as is noted, the, there is no actual discussion recorded in the minutes as to how they came to decide that that was an important issue. Um, if I may um, go back to the minutes, uh, paragraph yes. 11. So NHBT 00000073 underscore 018, please, Sully, page three. Uh, I hope I've got this right. <laughs> I saw it briefly then and it reminded me. So paragraph 11 should be on your screen, Dr. Lloyd. Okay. Um, yes, uh, in, in that uh, highlighted section uh, in, the, in the middle, we see both Dr. Gunson and Dr. Mitchell felt that if the results of the pilot study giving six true positives out of 10,000 donors were borne out in practice, then counselling would be manageable. Um, and I think if you're saying that counselling would be manageable, you're obviously saying that the test, introducing the test would be manageable. Um, so, you know, here we are with the first, referring to the first generation test, saying that the number of positives is manageable. And I think that's important to, to re remember as we go through this. Thank you. Um, and then, um Going, going through this chronologically, I'm going to ask you to look next at a, a document from early January 1991, not a document you would have seen at the time. It's PRSE 0002858. These are um, headed JDC notes of NBTS slash SNBTS management meeting 7th of January 1991. So these are Dr. Cash's own <coughs> notes um, of, of his meeting. Yes. Um, if we go to the second page and pick it up at paragraph 5, HCV donation testing. This Dr. Cash is recorded here, HG, that's Dr. Gunson, conveyed his concern that DOH mm -hmm. has still not decided on a start date. It now seemed probable that May, June 1991 would be the earliest possible. Two, HG advised that he believed the major problem for DOH was mechanisms for finding the money for NBTS RTCs and for E slash W, which I assume is England, Wales, confirmation testing. England, Wales, yes. The issue was mm -hmm. one of DOH's disinclination to fund centrally and insist on cross-charging, i.e. increasing the unit cost of blood supply to hospitals. Now, two questions arising out of that, Dr. Lloyd. The first is, as I understand your evidence, you had not been working on any assumption that the Department of Health would be funding this. You'd been working since 1989 on the assumption that the region would be funding it. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and secondly, did, did, did Dr. Gunson ever communicate to you the belief that is recorded here by Dr. Cash that this was an issue relating to um, the Department of Health trying to find the mechanism for, for finding the money? Was, was that something ever communicated to you at the time as a, as a potential cause of the hold-up? No, no, I, I wasn't... Um... <clears throat> I don't recall ever being told we're, we're on hold because they can't find the money. Uh, that, that message never, was, I can't recall it coming my way. Um, and then if we still in um, I do note in, if, if I may just interject yes. there, 
um, under the same uh, section five, uh, item three. Self requests a more definitive operational description for a start date. Um, it gives the impression that um, John Cash and the S Scottish Transfusion Service are unhappy about this um, vague issue of a start date, that they're, they're not happy with a May, June um, earliest possible. So, I, again, that's just a, yes. an observation. Thank you. Um, so if we then move a little further on in January of 1991 to NHBT 0000076 um, So this is a memo from Dr. Gunson, 22nd of January 91 to the regional transfusion directors, England and Wales. So you, you would have received this, Dr. Lloyd. Paragraph one, yes. the, the Department yes. of Health have agreed that routine testing of all blood donations for anti-HCV can be put into operation. Two, I've been asked to try and ensure that testing starts simultaneously in RTCs in England and Wales and that it's coordinated with commencement of testing in Scotland. Three, will you please advise me what you consider to be the earliest date that you could commence testing? Uh, four, financial arrangements to cover routine screening and supplementary tests have still to be concluded. I will advise of these at a later date. Um, and then there's a reference to um, a protocol being considered by the um, Advisory Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Diseases. Uh, and six, he says he'll inform Ortho and Abbott that routine screening has been improved and will inform them of the starting date in due course. Um, now, you responded to the invitation in paragraph three um, in a letter of the 7th of February, NHBT 0000073 underscore 044. So this is you on the 7th of February writing to Dr. Gunson saying the Northern Regional Blood Transfusion Service would be able to start HCV testing from approximately the 1st of April 1991. The company Abbott would be able to supply the first generation test by that date without any problems. I understand you've been in touch with the manufacturers with a view to ascertaining uh, when the second generation test would be available. Um, and, and then there's a reference to a concern about the relatively low incidence of positive confirmations and um, uh, saying it would be advantageous if there was a second generation test with improved specificity. As I read the, this letter, but please correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Lloyd, you're saying it would be good to have an improved second generation test, but it's not essential in order to get started and you can start with a first generation test. Is that right? Absolutely. Yes. We, we were ready to go with that first generation test. We, when we set things up, we didn't know that a second generation test was um, sort of just around the corner. I mean, you obviously know that improved tests are going to come. That it's the way it happens. Um, but yes, we were ready to go with the first generation test. Um, and then um, we we know that other. Um, regional transfusion directors also responded to Dr. Gunson's request with a, a range of, of different um, um, potential commencement dates. The next, I think, global communication from Dr. Gunson to RTDs is NHBT 0000191 underscore 077. Uh, again, we can see this is a, a, a round robin letter from Dr. Gunson, 15th of February, to all RTDs. If we go further down the page, um, he, he refers to minutes of a, the management committee. That, that we know that's the management committee of the National Directorate um, um, and some papers. Mm -hmm. If we go over the page, uh, he refers there to um, enclosing a report on the comparison of the Abbott and Ortho tests, which, of course, was the work you'd been involved with the previous autumn. Um, and then 
um, the second paragraph under paragraph 10, I've now been able to speak to all RTCs and an agreed date for commencement for anti-HCV screening of the 1st of July 1991 has emerged. This, of course, will be dependent upon a reasonably normal blood collection pattern at that time, since if the, if the later is still disrupted by affairs in the Gulf, I think that should be latter, we may have to reconsider yeah. the date. Um, do you have any recollection of, of what, what your reaction or, or feelings were? Um, bearing in mind you, you were ready to start at this point in time on the 1st of April, uh, being told it was going to be the 1st of July. I was upset. Um, I, I thought this was unnecessary. Um, and it's, there's nothing there that tells you why it's the 1st of July. Um, uh, and it's this sort of comment that an agreed date has emerged. I mean, you know, where did it come from? Um, certainly not from me. Um, and several other centres were ready and able to start um, earlier than this. So the agreed date is, you know, I, I was unhappy with that. I was definitely unhappy with that. Um, so that was setting me on the course for what happened afterwards. Um, and then um, if we go to PRSC 0002280. See, when it comes up, it, it's the further meeting of the Advisory Committee on the Virological Safety of Blood on the 25th of February, 1991. Um, if we go over the page, there's a heading towards the bottom of the page, Hepatitis C, UK BTS pilot study. And then if we go to the next page, please, Sally, and we just look at paragraph six, um, it refers to a paper tabled by Dr. Tedder um, and we can see that the question of second generation tests have, has now reared its head. The committee discussed the likely availability of the second generation tests and operational factors which might influence the decision by RTCs as to which screening test to choose. Licensing of the tests by FDA, that must be the second generation tests because we know they'd already been licensed the first generation, yes. um, had not yet been finalised. Mm -hmm. Members agreed it was important for proper evaluation of the ortho and Abbott 1 and 2 tests to be carried out before RTCs decided which test they would adopt. So this is the, the decision or recommendation of the ACVSB that before testing is introduced, there should now be a further evaluation comparing the first and second generation tests or looking at the second generation tests. Now, you obviously didn't see this, Sorry. but that information no. came, came to your attention. We'll, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, look, we'll look at how in due course. But um, in, in broad terms, what, what was, um, what, what's your view of the suggestion that there should now be this further evaluation involving the second generation tests? Sorry, can you remind me of the date? Was this February? This is the 21st of February, 1990. Sorry, 20, 25th. Okay. 25th. 25th of February, thank you, sir, 1991. Right, thank you. Um, okay. If I read that paragraph again, if you could perhaps um, enhance it for me. So just paragraph it, six, please, sir. Um, someone could bring. We'll do that. Yeah. It's a confusing statement. Um, likely availability of second generation tests, saying we're not sure when, it's only the likely availability. Um, and then um, operational factors might influence the decision of RTCs as to which screening test to choose. Um, that's very strange. Um, why would you choose between a first generation test and a second generation test? Um, you might choose between two or three different manufacturers of a second generation test, but why would we be deciding whether to do a first or second generation test? That really does not 
make sense to me. Um, members agreed it was important for proper evaluation of the Ortho and Abbott 1 and 2 tests to be carried out before RTC decided which tests they would adopt. So again, we're saying um, you might decide to go with some centres, and this is interesting, evaluation, um, centres decide which tests they would adopt. Would they adopt the first generation or the second? So now we're suggesting that you might have a situation um, once the second generation test eventually becomes available, that some centres will choose to use the first generation test doesn't make any sense. Dr. Loeb, we lost you there for a couple of Either the couple minutes of... are... Okay, we I was lost... repeating myself. No, no, no. We, we lost you for a couple of seconds, so I just wanted to check we didn't miss anything yeah. um, significant. Um, you said, you said no. this, and now we're suggesting you might have a situation once the second generation test eventually becomes available, some centres will choose to use first generation tests. And then we've missed a, possibly just a few seconds, okay. and then you said doesn't make any sense. Okay. So could you just repeat right. that point? I mean, you, certainly. This minute suggests that the situation might be after this testing that some transfusion centres would choose to use the first generation test and some centres would choose to use the second generation test. And that makes no sense. Um, either this minute is wrong uh, uh, and is does not correctly um, reflect what was being said, um, or there was a, a big problem over what they were talking about and what they were suggesting. Very strange. And, and it may be that we will, with other witnesses, need to explore the whole, the whole minutes, but I'll, I'll just flag up that in paragraph mm -hmm. 7, it says, the chairman summed up the view of the committee following discussion, um, and then... Um, uh, if we go over the page, there's, there's three bullet points there, and then over the page, the, the, the top of the page, the, the, the next point is ortho and Abbott 1 and 2 should in principle be available, among others, from 1st of July for RTCs to choose. So that is, I think, consistent with what, how you were reading that, that earlier mm -hmm. paragraph. Um, can, um, can, right. Dr. Can, can you help me uh, with this? Um, the principle, if it is a principle, that all regions should act as one together at the same time. Um, how does that relate to whether they're allowed to choose any, any one of four different tests? I mean, this, this is strange. I, I can understand centres going, being told to do it together and, um, and choose between Ortho and Abbott because they are giving you essentially the same results it is convenient to, you know, what you're set up to use. But being told here that it's okay to go with a first-generation test in one centre and a second-generation test in another does not match with that decision to do all testing, uh, start all testing together, because you're saying we can start with substantially different quality of testing, testing in different parts of the country in different centres. It, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't match. That, that, that's uh, obviously assuming that uh, there is a, a substantial difference in quality, as, as you might suggest from a second generation test, but it hadn't yet been established. Mm -hmm. um, well, if one makes that assumption, that, 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 would, that would follow, wouldn't it? Yes. Um, it, it would be extremely surprising if um, these companies introduced a second generation test that was no better than the first generation test, if I may say so. Yes. Um, um, and Ms. Richards, the, the remit of the a, a, ACVSB was safety, was it? Uh, um, it? One would hope so, given its name. Yes, I don't have the terms of reference memorized. I, I, think, we've, I think we've looked at the terms of reference. We have and, and, I, and I think they do put a primacy on, on safety. I'm fairly sure that's right. I'll certainly check. But, but we can check that. Yes. Um, Dr. Lloyd, just a couple of other documents um, I want to look at briefly with you, and then perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll take a break. The first is NHBT 00000191 underscore 110.
Uh, so this is a memo from you to uh, uh, colleagues within the, 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 the Northern Region Centre or service, 14th of March 1991. Yes. The start date for HCV testing set by the National Directorate is currently 1st of July. However, two centres in particular are, are unhappy about this. One of them is Cambridge. Um, now, that would suggest you'd had some discussions or communications um, with, with um, uh, some other centres. Do, do you recall what the mm -hmm. unhappiness was? No, I, I don't. I mean, when you read that, I would say the only, un, you know, if someone's unhappy about that date, that I don't know whether they were unhappy because it was too early or because it was too late. But I think if you look at some of the other documentation, uh, Cambridge was one of the centres that was looking for a later date. But I, that is purely from my memory. No, you're absolutely you right. Have documentation about that. You're, I think Cambridge had indicated it would be ready by October, so that might suggest the, the unhappiness yes. from their perspective. Um, you then refer to the procurement directorate looking at four potential suppliers of HCV kits. That, I think, is a, is a reference not to a, a northern region um, procurement directorate, but to the NHS procurement directorate or Department of Health procurement directorate. Yes. Um, and That's correct. Who, who wants, you say there, want several firms involved to enable them to obtain lower prices for the kits. Again, can, do you recall what the source of your information was in relation to, to that? No, I don't. Um, I don't know how I came by that. Um, I, I would imagine, I mean, that's the sort of thing that... Sorry, we lost you again, the, Dr. You know, Lloyd. The, yeah. Okay, no, I, I'll wait for a moment. Um, okay. I don't know where I got that information from. I'm sorry, I, I think okay. I was waffling a bit then. Um, I don't know where it came from. Uh, and then you say, I suggest we proceed as intended as soon as a second generation kit is available. So that's 14th of March. Um, if we then, just still in March, um, go to NHBT 00000062 underscore 039. Um, now, this is an internal um, Department of Health memo, 8th of March 1991, um, referring to the ACVSB decision to extend HCV screening evaluation. Um, and we can see mm -hmm. paragraph 2 sets out um, uh, uh, um, what's said to be the additional costs and, and, and so on in relation to this further evaluation. Paragraph three then records, I gather Dr. Gunson, who was not present at ACVSB on the 25th of February, has telephoned Mr. Fuller to say that he doubts whether the Newcastle and Glasgow centres have the laboratory capability to carry out the additional work now proposed. I understand also that Dr. Raymond is unsympathetic to Dr. Gunson's view on this, However, I think you should be aware that Dr. Gunson has raised this point as it seems to underline the need to look very carefully at what ACVSB has advised to be sure that an evaluation on the scale proposed is both necessary and practicable. Um, do, do, do you have any recollection of Dr. Gunson exploring with you Newcastle's capability to carry out the additional work, because as I understand it, it was anticipated that Newcastle would be one of the centres evaluating the second generation kits. No, I don't recall him uh, discussing it with us. There was absolutely no reason why we couldn't have done it. Um, and when I read this minute, I was, I was really quite surprised, put it politely, um, that this point had been made. Uh, certainly, there's no reason why we shouldn't have evaluated. Um, I also note in the previous um, minutes of the ACVSB that you showed um, that the original proposal for comparing the first and second generation tests was purely on the 10,000 samples. It wasn't a sort of a full-blown new study. Um, and maybe this letter um, alludes to the change in proposal from just testing stored samples to actually running 
um, sort of almost a, a live testing scenario, which would have been much more expensive uh, and time consuming. Um, I, I'm not going to go to the next document, um, which is a letter from the Procurement Directorate to Dr. Gunson in, on the 21st of March 1991, which sets out um, how it was proposed this second round comparative evaluation should be undertaken at Newcastle, North London and Glasgow. But the reference for the transcript is NHBT 00001911 underscore 115. The, the document I want to display before we take a break, Dr. Lloyd, is then Dr. Gunson's letter of the 3rd of April to all RTDs, NHBT 00000073 underscore 065. Um, this is um, uh, the letter in which he communicates the delay from July to September for testing. So if we go to the bottom half of the page, yes. you'll say, you'll recall that in my letter mm -hmm. to you of the 15th of Feb, I suggested that 1st of July 1991 might be an appropriate date to commence anti-HGV screening of blood donations. And then he refers to the availability of the second generation test kits and also to the possibility of other companies supplying tests, um, which I think is what your internal memo, Dr. Lloyd, had alluded to. Um, it then says the Department of Health has agreed that there should be a second round comparative evaluation of anti-HCV test kits at Newcastle, North London and Glasgow RTCs, together with appropriate confirmatory testing. Next paragraph. It is undoubtedly in our interest that this evaluation takes place. However, to complete this study and become operational by the 1st of July 1991 is too tight a schedule. It's difficult to state precisely a revised date but I think that we should aim to commence routine screening for anti-HCV by the 1st of September 1991. Now, after the break, I'll ask you about the decision that you, you then took. Um, but can you just assist with this? D Dr. Gunson sets out in that fourth paragraph his view of our interest um, and then the uh, proposal to move the date for, for testing back from July mm -hmm. to September, or forward from July to September, however you want to characterise it. Had there been, as far as you're aware, any discussion between Dr Gunson or anyone else from the National Directorate and regional transfusion directors such as yourself, or did this come out of the blue? This came out of the blue. This, this came completely out of the blue. Um, I had no idea this was being considered. Um, July was already too late, um, uh, and as perhaps we'll discuss later, this was the, um, as they say, the straw that broke the camel's back from, from my perspective. Um, so it, it is a, it was, yes, it was completely uh, a surprise when this arrived. So I'm going to suggest we take our break now. I've run on slightly later than I normally would for this session in any event, and then we can pick up Dr. Lloyd's decision and the response to that decision in one go after the break. Yes, well, let, let's uh, do that starting at uh, 10 to 3. Thank you. 10 to 3. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Your, your, your equivalent. Yes.